Welcome to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. I'm Soterius Johnson. This is the first in a four-part series checking out hidden gems and overlooked experiences in California's urban centers. Today, we'll talk about how to hack San Francisco. We'll explore the city in unique ways, starting with Josh Armel, who shares a surprising advantage to touring the city in an old-school Volkswagen bus. On a clear day, you have panoramic views looking all the way across the water to downtown Oakland and Mount Diablo way in the distance. It's stunning. So we've gotten up there many times and people said, I've been to the city dozens of times. I've never been here. This is amazing. After that, San Franciscan Magazine editor Erica Messner takes us to a few of her favorite haunts. A very, very old San Francisco bar established in the late 1800s survived prohibition. It's a great place to have a drink, relax, play some board games. And restaurant owner Mi Sun Boyce tells us about a San Francisco gem even the locals sometimes overlook, Treasure Island. That's all coming up on California Now. If you picture the San Francisco of the Summer of Love some five decades ago, it's hard not to also imagine a Volkswagen bus. Well, my next guest says riding in an old school VW is still a great way to take in the city. Josh Armel owns the Painted Ladies Tour Company, and he's here to take us beyond San Francisco's basics. Welcome to California Now, Josh. Hey, thank you so much for having me. So, Josh, I need you to start by describing for people who have never seen your buses, what makes your fleet stand out visually? Well, I have to laugh a little bit. Um, <laughs> I'd say I'd say it is definitely the eyelashes that are on the front of them. <laughs> yes, they, they are already vintage. You don't see brightly colored orange, hot pink buses from the 60s and 70s. Uh, but the fact that they have these whimsical eyelashes definitely make them a little more playful and put smiles on people's faces as we as we drive around. Uh, tell us the story. Like, what what got you the name Painted Ladies? Was it was it your fleet? Well, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. So, my wife is from Belgium, and her family was visiting. And right around that time, the city had changed their laws and regulations, and they banned large tour vehicles from places like Alamo Square, where those famous Painted Ladies houses are. So, um, this is about the time we were starting our business and thought, you know, what if people still want to go see those? Uh, We thought if they happen to be searching for that online, that maybe they would find us as a tour company that could still access those areas because of our smaller group size. So it was was a bit of a combination of that and the fact that we wanted to give the buses some personality and they're in themselves little ladies. So they each have a name, they've got personalities. (laughs) And so that's kind of kind of the gist of how we came up with that. That's really great. You know, that image of the Volkswagen bus, it really ties in with San Francisco history in a big way. Uh, Tell us about that. Definitely the summer of love, 1967, people's images of San Francisco as the epicenter for the hippie counterculture movement. You know, just visualize the bell bottoms, the long hair, the John Lennon glasses, you know, and flowers and tie dyes and everything like that. That was culminating here in San Francisco. So definitely from that aspect, it ties in. Also, I think some people have the images of California beach lifestyle as well. So those buses also seen cruising down Southern California, Northern California, definitely beachside and and, and watching the surfers kind of looking at the waves. So there's a couple tie-ins there. Yeah, and it's. I think it's a really great way to kind of experience that history, you know. And I'm sure, like a lot of your guests, probably have never been in a Volkswagen bus before, so that must be a real kick. That is, it's um, a surprise for a lot of them. First thing people do when they get in, they they start bouncing on the seats because there's actual, <laughs> <laughs> literally metal springs in the in the seat frames, whereas a modern vehicle, it's usually one solid piece of foam. So kids and even the adults they sit there and they start bouncing on the seats and they're like oh it's actually really comfortable i said yeah you know it's it's definitely a kick oh that's great i mean are are there any practical perks to taking visitors around in a smaller vehicle as opposed to like a, a standard tour bus absolutely i think the main things that we see is people get to connect not only with their tour guide directly in this small environment but also with one another where on a large format, double-decker type of bus, people usually are sequestered off to their two seats. 
They don't interact with their neighbors as much, um, let alone have direct questions to the tour guide. So it feels very intimate. And not only that, it's the places that we can go as well. Because of that smaller size, we can drive down Lombard Street, for example. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and San Francisco has a lot, has a lot of those areas where not maybe you don't have the widest street, so the smaller bus really you can get into those smaller places. Absolutely, I, I believe I read recently that San Francisco is the hilliest city in the United States. We're surpassed only by La Paz, Bolivia, as being more hilly than us. Wow! And so. Um, The other thing people notice is that a lot of the buses are manual transmissions. So going up and down these hills loaded with people, (laughs) it gets people's, you know, hearts racing a little bit. (laughs) And, um, you know, we have a little fun with that, you know, because obviously the staff and and drivers are very confident. But, you know, it gets people going a little bit. They're like, oh, my gosh, is this going to make it up the hill? Are we going (laughs) to, you know, so so definitely a little, little bit of that going on. Right. And I, I think a lot of people who just drive around in San Francisco sometimes feel that in their own cars, you know, so when they're driving up those hills, <laughs> stopping at a red light or something, it's kind of it's a little thrill. Absolutely. Yeah, they, <laughs> they always mention they're like, well, I'm sure glad that I'm not driving. Yeah. I mean, so let's talk about your tours. I mean, how how long is your typical San Francisco tour? Uh, who tends to sign up for it? It sounds like you get a, a, a big age range. Our group city tour is a two hour tour. It is meant to give people a kind of introduction and overview to the city and different neighborhoods, a lot of neighborhoods that they maybe wouldn't normally explore. We're not spending a lot of time in Fisherman's Wharf, for example, but hitting places like Hayes Valley, Lower Haight, and areas like that where they can get to see a little bit more of a local's perspective. There's three stops on that tour. We stop at the Golden Gate Bridge, those famous painted ladies' houses at Alamo Square, and also at the Palace of Fine Arts. So in two hours, they get a pretty in-depth overview of the city, lots of history, and uh, those photo opportunities make it definitely a fun, fun two hours to spend together. Yeah, it sounds like it. And I, I'm, do you get, do you get like folks who are nostalgic for the VW bus era, like maybe a lot of former hippies who want to bring their families with them, and, <laughs> <laughs> just to see, like, this is what we used to do when we were kids, you know? You do. And that's the funniest thing, because you never really know who you're going to get until they show up. And so this trip for different groups means different things. And some people, they've made custom T-shirts just for the tour or you get someone, yeah, that has been a VW bus owner. Some of them just saw it and thought, oh, wow, that looks so fun. We want to try this. So there's so many different types of customers that come along. But somewhere usually in there, there's someone that that has that memory of these buses in, the, in their past somehow. Mm. So um, take us on a, like an abbreviated, uh, you know, your typical San Francisco tour. What would be like the first place we'd go to? A bus will leave from the Fisherman's Wharf area or the Union Square area. So say we're starting in Fisherman's Wharf, we give them a little background, but then we get their blood pressure going right away. We head up into Russian Hill. Often, if it's a uh, morning, there's usually no issues to have a, a drive down Lombard Street. So mm. Lombard Street, for people listening, was you know formerly the crookedest street in the world. It's uh, very iconic, used in a lot of movies, but it's got eight hairpin turns. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's still a 16-degree grade, which is still steep, but originally it was a 27% grade. It was very, very steep, and that's why it was originally created into this crooked, crooked street that it is today. So that's usually something that's fun to start with. People have seen it and definitely a good way to kick things off. Yeah. And that, and that's, and that's an example of one of the places you can take your, your VW bus that some of those bigger tour buses wouldn't be able to to go down. Absolutely. Um, You can't get a a double decker bus down there. Uh, (laughs) And it's so funny because just recently, you know, it's kind of one of those things in, in the tour business, you it's like a, a unicorn, right? You, you've heard of the limo driver, the stretch limo driver that thought he could make it down Lombard mm. Street, right? And, you know, there's so many rumors and stories floating around of, oh, there's a wedding couple and they, they got stuck and they wanted to tip him extra to make it down, but they got stuck and had to get craned out. And, but it was funny because I went on um, YouTube and there's actually footage of, of limo drivers getting stuck on that street. And there is one one guy that 
made it all the way down and I had to laugh at it because he's probably a legend amongst stretch limo drivers, but it is definitely not <laughs> something you see often or I've never seen it actually on a tour. So, so it is definitely an advantage of taking a bus. We can easily make it down. No problem. That's really great that people can experience going actually down the street in, in, uh, you know, on your tour. So, okay. So that's, that's Lombard street. Where to next? From there, we would typically drive through the little Italy or North beach area, which has definitely a lot of history. So we talk about, you know, the Italian fishermen who kind of helped rebuild the neighborhood after the 1906 earthquake and began settling there. We also bring in a lot of the beatnik culture that was in the, in the neighborhood as well. City Lights um, Bookstore. City Lights Bookstore and Jack Jack Kerouac and uh, the alleyway they named after him, Cafe Vesuvio right there where they would you know drink to get inspired. We'll talk about Francis Ford Coppola and you know American Zotro films and the and the and the building that he founded down the road there. And I think it's kind of neat because if you go into Cafe Trieste uh, on the left side of Columbus, uh, they they had a photograph of Francis Ford Coppola sitting on his typewriter, typing out the manuscript to The Godfather, which I have to joke with people. This is you know, before iPads and computers, people literally had <laughs> right. the typewriter. <laughs> so it's a great neighborhood. Obviously, we, we bring in some of the food, you know, Tony's Pizza, 13 time world champion pizza maker and all the great little restaurants and gelato and, you know, some of the nightlife that's there, Cobb's Comedy Club and different bars and venues that might be fun for people to check out. So it's a mixture of history, but also what they might want to do when they're there, right? Right. It gives them kind of like a taste of what what the options are for them. You know, when the tour ends, they can actually kind of delve deeper uh, in whatever activities they, you know, that really attract them. Exactly. Are there any other neighborhoods that you really get to explore that deeply? Oh, yeah. You turn right onto Stockton Street and immediately you're in Chinatown. And so for a lot of people, it's shocking how quickly the neighborhoods change in San Francisco. And that's something we definitely talk about because it's a small city. It's seven miles by seven miles square. And one or two blocks often makes that big difference of how things look or feel. So we turn right and you're in the oldest and largest Chinatown, you know, outside of China. And it's, it's fun to tie in definitely um, some of the, the history um, Bruce Lee was born there. The, the fortune cookie was invented there. You know, we, we mentioned, you know, where they can actually go see fortune cookies being made at the Golden Gate Fortune Cookie Factory. Lots of great food opportunities, but some really authentic experiences there. And that's another reason actually why we like to drive down Stockton Street, because it's not the touristic shopping street that most tourists will go to. And so this is where the local Chinese are shopping. You can see the, the open air markets, the fish markets, all these types of things that you're just driving by. So it's it's pretty um, amazing to see the the change in neighborhoods and, and, and the cultural differences. And, and we, we talk a lot about that on the tours. Mm. Are there any, uh, you know, tour stops that, that really catch guests by surprise? I would say definitely the Haight-Ashbury is kind of a, a surprise for some people just because um, it does have really a unique look and feel. And sometimes you don't know what you're going to see, right? And uh, <laughs> we, I remember specifically, we were on a tour and there happened to be some uh, some nudists in the area. <laughs> well, my, the ladies on my bus thought it was a hoot and they were actually trying to track them down for photos. Um, and, <laughs> and funny that they, the guys ended up coming and standing near the bus and then the girls, they, the, the ladies kind of got a little shy all of a sudden. <laughs> They're in such close proximity, but it's... You know, these types of things can happen, and I am definitely not surprised when I see these, but for people from other areas of the, the country or world, it, it can it can be kind of shocking at first. So, yeah, that can definitely be a surprise. Yeah, and, and very memorable, too, I'm sure, for those for those ladies. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, what, what, are, what are your favorite stops or sites on the tour? I really do enjoy, as many times as I've seen it, going down to the Golden Gate Bridge. There's something about being... In that close proximity to the water of the bay, the open spatialness of the surroundings, the views, it's one of those things that I never get tired of. 
and it's still one of my favorite parts of the city. The city has so much to offer, but I always like the things that are just, you know, a little outside of the city sometimes, because that's a nice benefit of being there is you have all the culture and food and things that the city offers. And the Presidio kind of gives you a, a glimpse of something different. You know, it's an old military um, establishment decommissioned in 1994, and they did a great job of repurposing it into this public open space. So there's 1,600 acres, which is it's huge. It's, it's, you know, one and a half times the size of Golden Gate Park. It's, it's tremendous. There's hiking, there's biking, of course, these views of the bridge as well. So that happens to be kind of one of my favorite spots. So Josh, how customizable is your tour? Like, you know, if there's a site or a part of town, I'm just dying to see, can you work stuff like that in? Well, absolutely. So the first tour we were talking about was our, our group city tour, but we offer private tours all the time. So on a private tour, they're completely customizable. So we do often small team building events. We did a lot of wedding elopement packages, especially during the pandemic. They could be birthday parties, bachelor parties, or, or whatever. And and people will come up with their itineraries or ideas that they want to include. We can help collaborate with them. Things like that. People want to go to breweries. Um, we've done urban wine tasting out on Treasure Island. One thing that comes up regularly is a combination of city sightseeing and then going to Muir Woods to have a look at the giant coast redwood trees there. So we we do that as a private tour. Generally, it's about five hours. We can take in just about everything in the city, still drive over to Muir Woods, give them an hour to walk through there and come back through Sausalito. It, that, that makes for a nice balance of, you know, city and nature. And they get to see a little bit more than just you know, what, what's in the city itself. Yeah, no, that sounds really fun. Um, all right. So let, let's say I'm requesting a, a custom tour and I, I tell you, you know, I've been to the city before I've seen the golden gate bridge. I've been to Alcatraz and now I want to try somewhere new in San Francisco. What suggestions come to mind? I'd say one of my favorite neighborhoods uh, would be maybe the mission district. And I might be partial cause I lived there for quite some time, but It's got a lot of neat history, but I think the murals in that neighborhood are really outstanding. Maybe that's just because I do mediocre stick figures, but um, (laughs) (laughs) I really appreciate there's so much talent and and vibrant history and culture and food. I mean, I love telling people about La Taqueria, which is, you know, James Beard award-winning Taqueria, one of my favorite places to eat in the city. So sometimes we'll even take people there to, to grab some tacos or a burrito. That's definitely stuff that's off the beaten path a bit, uh, more of a local's neighborhood, something that typically you wouldn't find promoted on regular tourist maps in San Francisco. So that's definitely neat to check out. I think the Castro just up the street from them is great to check out. You know, so much history with Harvey Milk as well, um, early gay rights activist and then the rainbow crosswalks and all the, the the great sense of humor and kitschy names and the Castro theater. And, and from there, I'd probably venture up to twin peaks. Twin peaks is a, a beautiful overlook on a clear day. You have panoramic views looking all the way across the water to downtown Oakland and Mount Diablo way in the distance. And you can see Mount Tamil Pius. It's, it's, it's stunning. So that would be something I, I would easily recommend for a private tour, especially for someone who's been here. We've gotten up there many times and people said, I've been here. I've been to the city dozens of times. I've never been here. This is amazing. So I I think that would be a good one. So, Josh, you know, these are all really great insights. You know, your local expertise is really, you know, coming through as we speak. Um, But what I find really interesting is that, you know, you're doing it in this like super cool vehicle, this VW bus that, you know, a lot of people don't see every day. So I, I imagine you're probably you know, turning a lot of heads as you're driving through and also, you know, adding your own San Francisco character to the city. It's funny because you're exactly right. People are giving you thumbs up, big smiles, faces are lighting up. Uh, People feel like they're a celebrity, like they're a tourist attraction. Even, you know, tough looking biker dudes will light up and throw us a peace sign sometimes. So it's, it's definitely... Funny, and you can't lose sight of that. You know, sometimes, you know, if I'm thinking, I've got, I'm 
you know, in my head about something and then people are smiling and waving. You got to remember you're, you're in a vintage, you know, VW. People are just excited to see it. That's so great. Peace and love. Peace and love. Absolutely. Josh, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks so much for joining us on California Now. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Josh Armel owns the Painted Ladies Tour Company in San Francisco online at paintedladiestourcompany.com. As always, we'll have links to all the places we talked about on today's episode and lots more on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. San Francisco has inspired generations of writers and poets, from Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg to the likes of Mark Twain and Jack London before them. My next guest reports that tradition is alive and well today. Erica Messner is co-founder and editor-in-chief of the San Franciscan magazine, both online and in print. She says to get a feel for the city's literary vibe, you could easily make a weekend of it. Welcome to California Now, Erica. Thank you so much for having me. So to start out, tell us about the San Franciscan. Well, the San Franciscan is a new, relatively new print magazine celebrating the stories of the Bay Area. Um, It's a way for local writers and creatives to kind of showcase their best work in a really clean and well-designed publication. And we publish everything from poetry to fiction to artwork, photography, as well as uh, journalism that tells the stories of San Francisco. That's great. It's I, I'm I'm sure the you know writers must have must must be so grateful to have an outlet like the San Franciscan to uh, you know to have their work uh, featured in. Yeah, absolutely. It's a wonderful community here, and we hope to contribute to it as well as kind of build that shared identity and love for San Francisco. And you you've only started it a few years ago, right? What's the reception been like since then, like from your readers? It's been incredible. When you, when we first launched it, we really had no idea what it would grow into. Um, we just sort of put it out in the world, and the response we've received has surprised us um, in a good way with every <laughs> issue. And I think we've been able to make it better and better, um, and not just the response from readers, but the number of people who've reached out wanting to participate, wanting to contribute, really just feels like we have the community rooting for us. Um, and it's been incredible. That's really great. And you also have a a San Franciscan podcast as well, right? That's right. We have a fiction podcast where our short story authors come along and read their stories. And you can find that on Spotify and on our website as well. That's really great. So I I imagine working with so many interesting writers and artists uh, in the city, it must broaden your perspective of the city. It really does. I've learned so much about San Francisco. And one thing our magazine really focuses on is kind of taking a second look at the familiar, whether it's your neighborhood coffee shop, the bookstore down the street, you know, the theater that you've always wanted to visit, but never quite gone into Mm -hmm. getting into those stories and really learning about where you live. So is there an example maybe of a, uh, of a piece the magazine ran that, that gave you a new appreciation for something great about the city? So we published a piece in our, a couple issues ago, about the historic rock ballrooms of San Francisco Hmm. and that specific era um, of late 60s music in the city and appreciation for the Avalon and the Fillmore and the concert promoters behind those venues and just how kind of the scene really exploded for a couple of years and then disappeared. And we had a playlist that went along with that piece and just hearing that music and reading those stories, I think, gave me new appreciation for that side of the city. Oh, yeah, that's great. And that's, uh, yeah, having a playlist like that, that must have like, for people who lived through it, it must have been a really great way to remember, you know, what it was like. And then for people who weren't there, who maybe weren't even alive at that time, it really just gives you a kind of a visceral sense of what the the scene was like. Yeah, it was really fun to put together. And the author of that piece, Nikki Collister, she was actually able to interview one of our previous poets who wrote for the magazine because he was there. He was a college student at the time. So that was a really neat connection. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right. So so let's say, you know, I, I'm an old friend visiting from out of town. You know, it's not my first time in San Francisco. Um, and I'm looking for something new on a Friday night. Where are you taking me? Calendar allowing on a Friday night. I would take you to a local reading series. You know, I think there's an impression about San Francisco that kind of the artistic community is on the way out and the literary culture is dead. But in my experience, you know, it's just not true. There's really a vibrant current art scene in San Francisco. 
and I would show that to you. I would take you to a poetry reading or a mixed genre reading. There's an incredible reading series called The Racket run by Noah Sanders, who's Mm -hmm. our books editor for the San Franciscan. Um, And they host regular local readings at bars around town at the Sycamore and the Mission frequently. And it's just really, really cool to kind of be a part of that work in progress. Often authors will share writing they're actively working on or trying to publish. And it just really invites you into the conversation, into their process. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So so you can actually kind of, uh, you know, hear some of these stories that might be coming out, uh, you know, in the next year or two in, in print somewhere or maybe on public radio. But you kind of are hearing them in kind of like a workshop being kind of mode. Yes, exactly. And we kind of think about poetry readings historically, you know, berets and finger snaps, um, or you think about (laughs) kind of the 90s in in the bar poetry readings, but it's still happening um, in spite of, you know, our online communities, it's still happening in real life. Right. That's really great. So I I know these uh, these readings, they they move around to different venues. Um, What are some of your favorites? Yes, one of my favorite spots is called the Little Shamrock on the south side of Golden Gate Park, specifically for poetry reading. Um, I was there recently in early December for a reading and the book release of our poetry editor, Sydney Vogel. Um, it's a great place to have a drink, relax, play some board games, but a very, very old San Francisco bar established in the late 1800s survived prohibition, (laughs) has just like a really rich history and, you know, photographs of the old owners on the wall. And they have a back room. The story, the myth, the story is that the back room was where the drinking happened during prohibition, you know. So it's like this kind of box space in the back, not many windows. And we had a poetry reading there with incredible readers kind of packed to the brim and it's just really cool to be in a place like that where people are so intently focused on poetry and then, you know, it ends and there's wild cheering. It's just like the enthusiasm for um, literature and poetry is so unique and so special. Okay, so so let's say Saturday comes around. Uh, where to next? I would start Saturday morning in North Beach um, by stopping early in the morning at Liguria Bakery, which is a... 100-year-old bakery um, run by an Italian family, an incredible, incredible spot for focaccia. Mm -hmm. The best focaccia that they have is the raisin focaccia. It has kind of a sweet and salty blend, but they do sell out really, really quickly. So you have to get there at 7 when they open. Um, We've written about their story in the San Franciscan. It's just, you know, super tasty, great way to start the day. Yeah. It's funny, you know, I mean, North Beach is, uh, you know, known for being kind of like the little Italy of San Francisco, but I, most people don't think of it, as, uh, think of it as a place that you would go to so, for like breakfast or brunch. So I, I love that idea to, you know, going to a bakery, getting the freshly baked focaccia, you know, right at the source right there in Little Italy. Yeah. And it's super special. You know, they have a way of slicing through the focaccia, ra- wrapping it up in paper and tying it with string. It's just, you know, classic, <laughs> Very handmade. Old Old school, exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so where else in the neighborhood? So I have to recommend a literary tour of North Beach run by my friend and a fellow writer, Scott Latiri. He leads uh, this tour called the San Francisco Historic Literary Tour, um, focused on the writing community. The ones you've probably heard of, Allen Ginsberg, Mark Twain, Jack Kerouac, as well as sort of the culture of the neighborhood as it exists today. The last time I met Scott in North Beach for coffee, and we walked from there to City Lights Bookstore, um, incredible historic bookstore. And just in that, you know, short 10-minute walk we went on, I think he said hi to like 15 people. You know, he knows everybody. (laughs) He's that guy. He's the mayor of North Beach. Yes, exactly. Mayor (laughs) of North Beach. He can introduce you to kind of like the living folks who remember this history and were part of um, these movements. And that's just really cool, really special to see how it lives on as as kind of an Italian small town with a lot of culture and stories. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned City Lights because, you know, it's not really a hidden gem, but if you're in the neighborhood, you can't not go, right? Right. If you haven't been, don't miss it. There's around the corner from City Lights, um, there's a spot called the Beat Museum, which is really cool, small um, spot that celebrates that particular history and culture. And I think it's a stop along the tour 
um, but definitely recommend checking that out as well. All right. So that was Saturday. Um, we wake up on Sunday. We're going to head out again. And I'm kind of feeling like maybe more pastries might be in order. <laughs> so where are we headed? So on Sunday morning, I have to give a shout out to my own neighborhood, Potrero Hill area dog patch. We're headed to neighbor bakehouse to grab pastries. They have a delicious guava and cheese pastry, as well as a pistachio mm. blackberry twice baked croissant and many, many other delicious pastries. Mm. Yeah, that sounds amazing. So do you like, uh, you, do you order them to go and you take them somewhere or do you kind of just have them there? Yes. So there's no indoor seating at this spot. So I'd carry the pastries over to Crane Cove Park, um, which is on San Francisco Bay. And Crane Cove Park used to be a shipbuilding site. So they have plaques along the water that kind of describe the history as a shipbuilding site. And they've preserved this giant slip where they used to build and launch the ships. Um, so it's just really cool to see that and see the water, have your pastry at a picnic table. Very nice spot. That's really cool. So so where else, you know, if I wanted to get some more fresh air, I mean, is there someplace else to do it? Is there any chance of maybe getting out on the water? Yes, yes. So right behind Crane Cove Park um, is a local business spot called Dog Patch Paddle. And you can rent stand-up paddle boards and kayaks to take into the bay. Um, and there's a beach where you can launch into the water. And then you can even take your paddleboard or kayak over to Oracle Park. You can kind of stay in the calmer sections of the water <laughs> um, and, while exploring the that side of the city, the east side of the city. That's really cool. So like for somebody who maybe isn't all that experienced with kayaking or paddleboarding, is it something that you really have to know going into it? Or do they kind of have guides or help you out with, you know, actually getting out on the water? Yeah, I believe they have guides and lessons you can take as well if you haven't done it before. All right, so let's do let's do one more dealer's choice. Uh, it could be a place featured in the San Franciscan, or or just somewhere that you like to unwind. What comes to mind? Ooh, I do have one featured in the San Franciscan, um, which is the Farallon Islands, a kind of desolate, windswept group of islands off the coast of San Francisco, really? thirty miles Never off the coast. Never heard of them. Wow. Yes. Yeah, many people have never heard of the Farallon Islands. They're off, right off the coast of San Francisco on a clear day from a high hill. You can see all the way to the Farallons. And when you're out near the Farallons, um, sometimes you can see points in the city as well. So what's so great about them? The experience around the Farallon Islands usually would be kind of a whale watching tour or a bird watching tour run by organizations like Oceanic Society here And you can go out on a boat, spend kind of a day cruise, getting to know the islands. And they are a very unique protected marine environment for seabirds, for sea lions. Great white sharks is a big attraction out there. Well, I don't know about attraction. Depends who you are. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to need a bigger boat. (laughs) Yeah. But it's it's, um, the Fairland Islands are the largest seabird rookery in the continental United States. So that means during breeding season for seagulls, you know, you can cruise out there and view the birds and just, you know, deafening shrieks of seagulls. I don't know if I'm selling this or not, (laughs) but if you're a birder, if you're a birder, it's very, very cool. Also California sea lion breeding ground. Um, It's just really unique spot for wildlife. Yeah, no, it sounds like whale watching. Yeah. So it's a totally uninhabited string of islands that you can actually step foot on, like you can take a boat out to. That's a good question. Yes. You can take a like whale watching cruise out there, but because they're protected marine islands, you can't walk on them. There's only like a handful of scientists that live there year round, like studying the life on the island. Got it. That's really amazing. I mean, Erica, that's the perfect way to end our conversation on hidden gems. I mean, what better hidden gem than a string of islands off the coast of the city? I mean, who who knew? Erica, thanks so much for joining us on California Now. Yeah, thank you so much. It's really fun. Erica Messner is co-founder and editor-in-chief of The San Franciscan in print and online at thesanfranciscanmagazine.com. We'll be back in a moment with more of San Francisco's hidden gems. This is California Now.
If you're a traveler who's on the lookout for more hidden gems and overlooked experiences throughout the Golden State, you really ought to check out the latest California Visitor's Guide. From remote scenic byways to unique restaurants that are still neighborhood secrets, it's full of unforgettable experiences even many locals don't know about. And it's a beautiful planning tool worth having both on your coffee table and in your weekend getaway bag. Plus, there's an exclusive interview with chef and entrepreneur Aisha Curry, who also adorns the cover. You can order your free 2022 California Visitor's Guide online at visitcalifornia.com slash cvg. Again, that's visitcalifornia.com slash cvg. My next guest wants to call your attention to a gem so hidden that many San Francisco locals overlook it, even with the word treasure right there in the name. I'm talking about Treasure Island, located in the middle of San Francisco Bay, just off the bridge to Oakland. Misun Boyce owns the Treasure Island restaurant Merced and is a former officer and commodore in the Treasure Island Yacht Club. Welcome to California Now, Misun. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Absolutely. You know, and I, I want to start out with a confession. Of, you know, I've been to San Francisco many times and I've never set foot on Treasure Island. Uh, what am I missing? Wow. Uh, where do I begin? You and many other, many other San Francisco local, in fact, native San Francisco residents who have lived in the city for 25, 30 years have also never stepped foot on Treasure Island. There's actually two islands as you exit the uh, Bay Bridge and once you take that exit, that big hill is actually uh, called Yorba Buena Island. Um, the man-made part of the island was constructed, I think, in 1936-37 uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, and, and primarily out of mud that they dredged from the bay. So it's originally, it was actually um, built to host the, uh, in 1939 and 1940, the Golden Gate International Exposition. It was supposed to be the San, the San Francisco's international airport until the Navy took it over. Mm. So, so what's so great about it? Like why, like if somebody was visiting San Francisco, why would you tell them you absolutely have to hit Treasure Island? There's so many things to see that a lot of things that people aren't even aware of. Not only obviously the ferry service that's going to start at the end of this month. It is the single most spectacular view of the skyline, not only of the skyline of San Francisco with the Salesforce Tower and Coit Tower and the Transamerica and the skyline, but to when once you're on the island, on the left, you could see the Bay Bridge to the city, and then you span the skyline. You'll see images of the Golden Gate Bridge, and then right in front of you is, of course, the, uh, the, the historical Alcatraz. It's almost within reach from Treasure Island. Hmm. So you get like the sweeping view from like San Francisco to Alcatraz, all across, all around, even Oakland. So let's talk about your restaurant, Merseille. How do you describe it to people? So my partner, Park Ulrich, and I decided to build, had this crazy idea to build a restaurant on the island, the island that no one had even heard, barely even visited. And we took a risk several years ago, and we've been open about four years. And what's unique is the fact that we built it entirely out of shipping containers. Oh. So we built it out of 13 shipping containers. Not only do we have, we everything is about recycling, repurposing, and upcycling. So we utilized uh, pallets for seating, um, reclaimed wood. We used uh, leftover pieces of containers for some seating area. And we even built our own bocce courts. It's a great destination. Uh, not only do you, we, we have this tagline where we say, come for the view, but just stay for the food. My <laughs> partner is one of the best chefs in San Francisco. He's an executive chef partner at Water Bar and Epic Steak. And so he brings that um, freshness and, and, and farm to table, you know, sensibility in terms of the ingredients to a very casual restaurant. We have fish and chips, cheeseburger, tacos, pizza, very family-friendly friendly food. In fact, we're even dog-friendly. We have a huge open courtyard, especially in the COVID time that we're living in right now. Right. Um, having this open-air seating and then our two main seating areas have garage doors, so you have that airflow. So I, I wanted to, to dig into the menu a little deeper. So are, are there any kind of like surefire crowd pleasers that you know people always ask for when they come to your restaurant? Uh, one of our signatures, actually, uh, my partner who loves chowder, 
Um, he's a little bit of a chowder snob, in fact, <laughs> and uh, we he he had to put his name on it. He he's so <laughs> shy. We just call the fish chowder. Not it's it's similar to clam chowder, but it's actually that white sauce, but it's fish. And mm-hmm. uh, not everyone likes clams, but he um, didn't want his name on it. But because because it became so popular, it takes about two and a half hours to make. We use fresh ingredients. And it's so popular that at some point we want to actually have a chowder fest and challenge all the chefs in the city to come <laughs> and bring their chowder and compete with us. So, oh, wow. That's right. So does he use like a certain kind of fish or is it just whatever the fresh fish of the day is? We use fresh haddock. Um, it's a light, flaky white fish, but it's all the ingredients in the, in the two and a half hours it takes to actually make it. So mm-hmm. I would definitely say Park's chowder. Um we also have even something as simple as our tacos. We have fish or chicken and for the vegetarians, even tofu taco. But what what usually seems like a very simple taco is has so much love into it from we griddle the uh, soft corn tortilla. So it's not fried, but and we don't fry the fish or the chicken. We we make the chicken. We cook it from scratch, but also the fish. We griddle it as well. We don't fry it. And then the coleslaw has a cilantro sauce that we make in-house. Then we also put in a little chipotle crema, which, mm. we, which we also make from scratch. And then our salsa, we also make from scratch. You know, it all sounds so great. I mean, so 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 let's plan a, a Treasure Island outing for me. I mean, let's say I'm, I'm staying in San Francisco and I want to check out the island. How should I get there? Well, once the ferry starts, absolutely take the new ferry over to the brand new ferry terminal on Treasure Island. It's right in front of Building 1 where you can actually visit the Treasure Island Museum. So start there in the morning, go visit the museum and see the history. And you can even um, walk around to the to see the uh, le- where the Clipper Cove is and then stroll down to along the water. And y- you're not going to stop taking pictures. I mean, <laughs> it, people, it is... It's almost indescribable. And, and to say that it's a beautiful view is, is an understatement. You have to see it to really believe how beautiful the San Francisco skyline is. And you can see it from Treasure Island. And it's amazing that people have not visited after all these years. So it truly is a discovery. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so let's, say I, let's say I'm getting thirsty. And <laughs> what are some nice <laughs> options for a beverage on Treasure Island? That's a great question, and, and this is the little secret that a lot of people aren't aware, that there are distilleries. Um, the Probably the most famous one is the Gold Bar Whiskey. Um, they, I, I believe they are, they are the official whiskey for the San Francisco 49ers, and amazingly enough, they brew uh, their whiskey on Treasure Island. So you can arrange tasting. So, Misan, you know, it seems like Treasure Island is kind of like at this in this kind of moment of transformation where it's going to be uh, more developed in the coming years. Um, so, you know, if people want to see it kind of in its more you know, natural, undeveloped state, and this would be the time to go visit, right? Absolutely. Now more than ever, uh, the transformation has been a long time coming. I think they've been working on it for almost 20, 25 years and I think that's why many of the people in the city didn't bother coming to Treasure Island because they thought it was never going to happen. Well, I am in the heart of it and the pulse of it, and I am telling you, it is happening. The mere fact that they've already built the ferry terminal and their the homes that are being sold on Yorba Buena Island, and they've already started the construction on Treasure Island for the about 8,000 homes. And so if you truly want to see the island and be part of the history and then see the evolution Visit now. It, it is in a transformative period right now, and it will, at the blink of an eye, next thing you know, um, it won't be what it is today. Well, Misan, this has been so amazing. Thanks so much for joining us on California Now. Well, thank you. What a wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. Misan Boyce is owner of Merced, online at merced.restaurant. This is California Now. Thank you for listening to California Now. We hope you enjoyed this episode and get a chance to hit the road soon. This podcast is produced by Visit California. I'm your host, Satirius Johnson. You can find our show on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please subscribe. And don't forget to order your free 2022 California Visitor's Guide online at visitcalifornia.com slash cvg. 
That's visitcalifornia.com slash CVG.